Welcome to Your Turn. I am John Smith. I'm Jason Speedy. Um, today in the news, former Leafs coach and Canada coach Pat Quinn has passed away. Uh, Jason has some reflections on that. Uh, Jason? Well, uh, uh, he had a fantastic career. There's no question about it. Um, you know, uh, Pat Quinn, 71 years old, was involved in hockey for many years. Um, not a lot of people uh, really associate him as having a, a career as a hockey as a player, more as a coach, obviously, over the last few years. But um, he he play he he's coached the Philadelphia Flyers, L.A. Kings, um, Vancouver Canucks, oh, Toronto Maple Leafs, Leafs, and the Edmonton Oilers. Most most recently, uh, he's fifth all time on the most wins list as a coach, which which is uh, you know phenomenal. Um, 1980. Coached the Flyers, uh, coached them to the Stanley Cup. Uh, also, he coached the Vancouver Canucks 94. to the Stanley Cup in 1994 with a phenomenal team led by Pavel Bure, Trevor Linden. Uh, he was also Jack Adams winner in 1982 or 1980 and 1982. Um, his list of accomplish accomplishments is is go on and great. on. Great, yeah, for sure. Uh, Helped uh, lead Team Canada with Olympic gold in 2002. 2002 end of 50 year drought. That end of 50 year drought. We can all remember that. Um, also, was head coach for the 2004 um, World Cup of Hockey Championships. Um, he won gold medals in 2008 and 2009 for the under 18 and under 20. Um, just a phenomenal coach. Phenomenal coach, phenomenal man. Uh, may he rest in peace. And uh, let's uh, continue on, I guess. Um, Connor McDavid, uh, another hot topic in the, the NHL with fighting. He was uh, took a, exception to a dirty hit, I guess. From well, I don't know if, necessarily know if it was a dirty hit, but he took exception to a hit, got in a fight, and broke a finger. Mm. Um, he is now out until the G World Juniors, uh, beginning of Christmas, so six weeks. Uh, there was a lot of criticism on that whether he should have dropped the gloves, where he is a superstar player. Um, however, that is the kind of fighting that we are trying to keep in the league where it's spontaneous. So, yeah. um, kind of what do you think on that? Like, should he have dropped the gloves or should he have waited for a teammate to stick up for well, him? Well, you have both sides of the argument. You know, some people, uh, you know, believe hockey, uh, in hockey, you know, fighting is, is very much, you know, a very integral part of the game. Other people don't see it that way so much. So, um, you know, it depends on which side of the aisle you line up on, really. Um, you, you'll have your detractors that say that, um, you know, he shouldn't have done it and he's too important to the team and, you know, for his long-term uh, future. I mean, this shouldn't have any impact with that, no. but for the, you know, for the team current... Team Canada. And, and for his current team and Team Canada going and forward, it could impact. And, you know, I mean... Other people, like I said, on the, depends on how you see it. You know, they they, they see that as um, you know sticking up for themselves, yeah. for their teammates, things like that. I, I recall back in um, the the Stanley Cup Finals when Tampa Bay and Calgary were playing, and again Le, Le Cavalier, uh, you know, Dropped squared it. off there. Um, you know, again, some people you know didn't think that the, that shouldn't have should have taken place because they were you know the captains of their team. You know, Game Seven of the Stanley Cup Finals, you know, they need to be on the ice. So um, it depends on how you see it. <laughs> no, exactly. I, I give the kid credit for um, sticking up for himself, but uh, at the same sense, he's not known as a fighter, so he's got to kind of remember that he's more valuable to a team as a scorer rather than... But, I mean, it would be hard to take that kind of abuse day in, day out, have yep. the defense focus in on you and you be their primary target. So... Um, good on him. We wish him a speedy recovery and oh, hopefully absolutely. he's back for uh, the World Juniors because he will be an integral part of Team Canada for the World Juniors. Absolutely. I mean, he is a f uh, just a phenomenal talent and I mean, having him on, on your team going into an international tournament like that is only going to bode well for Team Canada. Definitely. So, yeah. um, the Leafs, uh, I don't really want to talk about them too much. They've kind of let me down a little bit in the last uh, while, but uh, we do have to talk about them a little bit. Um, so they were on a nice little roll, and then they decided to lose 6-2 to two and 9-2 to two, um, to Buffalo Sabres and the Nashville Predators. They come back and rebounded with a very nice win to the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, they preceded that win by not saluting their fans at center ice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the media decided to have a big uproar about this, saying it was very disrespectful of them. They're pay getting paid all this kind of money, and playing for the fans, so they should salute the fans. I myself am a fan. If they're winning, I don't care if, the, if that's the bottom line. Like, yeah. if they're winning the games, playing hard, that's enough of a salute to me. Mm -hmm. 
but it's just kind of the way they did it, I guess. Um, well, you know, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I've been paying attention to, to sports all, all my life, and I've, I've never heard of this tradition of saluting the fans um, as being taken as seriously as it has been over the, you know, the last week. Oh, um, you know, uh, in the other sports, football, basketball, baseball, they necessarily don't tip their cap, you know, um, wave to the crowd at the end of each game. Uh, so, you know, I mean, like you said, I mean, bottom line is if they're winning games and, you know, doing uh, what they can to, to win each and every game and putting themselves in a position to win, exactly. what more can you ask for? I, I find that, um, you know, with the Leafs getting, getting beat there last week by, by Nashville and um, um, Chicago really putting the gears to Edmonton there over the weekend. Um, and the way that the fans are kind of um, lashing out and showing their frustrations with, with their teams, um, I, I find this is becoming a little bit of a new new norm, yeah. that fans are becoming a little bit more, more, uh, vocal. In, more vocal, more involved. Well, uh, being a Leafs fan, as I have been, they've made the playoffs once in the last 10 years. Um, Edmonton uh, has struggled equally as well. They've now in position for, I believe, the fourth time in the last five years for a lottery pick. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, fans are certainly getting frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, you guys, as fans, we'd like your opinion. Uh, so if you want to call in and give us your take on if you think the Leafs fans um, have a right to be upset and if the Oilers fans have a right to be upset, and then even if the Leafs should have saluted or if they shouldn't. Uh, the number is uh, one 529 8826 Again, it's uh, John Smith here and Jason Speedy. We're going over uh, just sports talk. We're um, just going over how bad the Leafs and the Oilers have been playing and how the fans have been reacting. Um, the Oilers were heckled very badly um, after the 7-1 loss to Chicago, which you started to say. Yeah. Um, they were The fans lined outside the dressing room and gave them a nice booing. So... Um, it's kind of invoked a kind of some spark, I guess, in the fans to mm -hmm. and the managements to m maybe do more for their team. So yeah, well, I mean, I, I feel Edmonton fans definitely have a uh, little bit more of a of, of a gripe, if you will. I mean, they've had number one picks there the last few years: Neil Akbar, Nugent Hopkins, Taylor Hall was number two pick, I do believe. Um, you know, I mean, they've they really haven't. Come, to the next they step. haven't really performed or, or progressed the way that they would have no, felt that they would not. have or wanted them to. Taylor Hall is a very good hockey player. There's no question about that. But as far as Yakupov and, and Nugent Hopkins, Everly is another one, Jordan and, Everly. And I mean, then even Leon Dreisaitl, they're throwing him into the fire this year. He's an 18-year-old. Um, I have read that they are um, dangling anybody in a trade at the moment. Like yeah. uh, anybody is up for grabs for a top-line center. So. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe they are getting a little more proactive, whereas Toronto, I haven't really heard too much coming out of there, rather than just kind of stay the course and see how it happens. So. Is it, uh, you know, is that more of a, or, 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 I mean, obviously, it, um, Leafs fans aren't, aren't happy with, with mediocrity, but is there, is there an opinion or an attitude with management that we can put out whatever team we want because we're going to have definitely. the revenue and the fans support us. That definitely and maybe with feels this, that way with, with, the with the the latest, you know, um, outburst from the fans, if you will, um, might that maybe get the management to maybe think differently if that was their attitude? It's really it's really hard to say with the Leafs. Like it seems they 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 can play well, but they. Uh, they don't seem to step it up very well, so. Okay. Um, I do have a caller on the line. It's Terry from Bracebridge, Ontario. Uh, go ahead, Terry. Yeah, John, I just wondered, uh, what do you think the problem is? Would it be the players or the management of the Leafs? Um, in my personal opinion, I believe there is a little bit of issues with both. Uh, I believe it starts with the coaching. The coaching does definitely have to get your um, players ready to play a game. Um, and that seems to be the issue with the Leafs is when they show up ready to play, they play well, but if they don't show up ready to play, they get spanked. Yeah. So it's definitely, I'd say it's on the coach to get your players ready to play and motivated. Um, but I'd also say it's on the players to show up and play. So I'd say it's a little bit of both. Um, there's not as many good coaching options in the NHL at the moment, although I, if they do fire, I'd certainly like to see Dan Balsma um, as an option for the Leafs. Uh, he's still out there, so mm -hmm. um, I, I believe they've got to, uh, I believe they've got to um, stay the course and maybe for the next month, if they start to flounder, then get rid of Carlisle, and uh, if they kind of step it up, then 
maybe make a trade or two to improve the team. So, mm -hmm. uh, what is your opinion? Like, is well, when a team's yeah, playing? I'm pretty much bang on with what you're saying there. It's just it's so frustrating. It just you want them to make the playoffs, and then they come right out of the gate full guns at first, and then uh, they just seem to fall apart halfway through. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely it's an interesting. It's a hard time to be a Leafs fan. Uh, I definitely can attest to that. It's uh, I'd say it'd be equally as hard to be a Sharks fan or an Oilers fan at the moment as well. Um, Calgary, though, uh, out of teams that are kind of taking pe teams by surprise. Um, yeah. So what you're calling from Ontario, Terry? Yes. Um, so what, what? So what? With, with my point about um, is, is management comfortable with putting out mediocrity, or or is there a real you know drive to get you know uh, a top-notch team out there because of you know the, the the you know the Leafs fan base is so rampant and 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 loyal that whatever they put out there, they're they're still going to be making their their yep. money. Exactly, because like I can't even afford to go to a game. Right. And, you know, it's, it's frustrating that uh, it, it doesn't matter. We still fill the house every game, mm -hmm. whether they play uh, awful or if they play good. I actually uh, read a sports article the other day, and it's going to surprise a lot of people, but uh, the Leafs fans were ranked as the best fans in the NHL. Yeah. Um, just as you said, is they, they, continue, they continue to um, sell out regardless whether they win or lose. Um, and the... Uh, the ticket prices are extraordinarily high. They're the highest in the league, and then you're still selling out regardless of whether you've got a good team or not. Um, however, if they want, if they really, in my opinion, if they were to wanted to make a lot of money, if you look at the Raptors and how well they sell out every game, um, you could make a lot more money. Like if you're winning, like the Raptors Square, that's two, three thousand, four thousand fans outside watching the game. Yes. So if the Leafs ever did put a good team on the ice, they could certainly, I don't want to say this, but they could certainly jack prices because people are going to pay them and they could certainly have fans across the world because they do have the most fans in the NHL. So Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Well, I wish they'd bring an NHL team to Hamilton. Maybe that would make... Uh... Yeah, that would definitely maybe... Uh, can you imagine if they brought in another team into Ontario and they won a cup, or another team into the Toronto area and they won the cup before the Leafs? Yeah. Uh, what kind of an uproar that would be? I would love it. <laughs> yeah, it would okay, definitely... well, thank you for taking my call. No problem. Thank, thank you, you for calling in, Terry. Okay, bye now. All right, and then uh, again, guys, it's an open call in show, so if you guys do have any questions or you just want to uh, throw out your opinion, it's 1 855 529 8826. It is good to call across Canada, no long distance, so uh, feel free to give a call and uh, ask me and Jason some questions or just shoot out your opinion because we do like to hear everybody's opinion. So um, moving on now, uh, we're going on to the uh, Slava Voinov. That's still a hot topic in the NHL. Uh, he's, the NHL and the NHLPA have come to an agreement to give the LA Kings some cap relief for him. Yep. Um, for those of you who aren't aware about the Voinov situation, he was suspended a month ago thereabouts uh, indefinitely with pay by the NHL for an altercation of domestic abuse against his wife. Um, his wife does not wish to press the charges. She does not um, believe that he has anything to, like he didn't mean to give her harm. Um, however, it was miscommunication between a language barrier, I guess, between the Russians and the police and the police have continued to press charge so um, that's kind of an interesting situation uh, how can they force somebody to press charge when well California laws stipulate that it's 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 up to the discretion um, even though if 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 the victim does not want to follow through with charges so um, they didn't consider their wishes in this in this manner and are definitely following through with with charges and I, I believe the NHL has um, just kind of overstepped their boundaries in my opinion just kind of in reaction to all of the other leagues facing media scrutiny for their suspensions like Ray Rice, Adrian Peterson uh, there's been a few in basketball as well, mm -hmm. um, so I believe the NHL kind of just rather than have their name kind of well, they what, just jump the gun. what I think you're saying is um, with 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 Facebook and and Twitter and you know the other social media, um, 
it gives every fan a voice. And when every fan lashes out negatively negatively and you know they have an audience so when one turns into two turns into five ten people and then it just keeps on gaining momentum no, exactly. um it forces the, the leagues to act and act quickly swiftly and maybe <laughs> and maybe not considering all the legal ramifications as far as like you just said contracts um the collective bargaining agreements that they've what signed they've agreed on, to and, what they've agreed to and stuff because they they want to get the message out to the fans that they are doing something they're doing something they're taking yeah. care of this and they do um value you know the so the pressure from the social oh, exactly. the social masses if you will and i mean what what I think what what happened with with the Ray Rice incident it's 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 opened the eyes and opened the doors to a lot of what's been masked or been going on before. Yeah. Um, it just didn't it, we didn't have video cameras everywhere um, that we turn and we didn't have you know the uh, avenues to to get to get the videos out there to get the videos out there to get the messages out there and get other opinions i mean you have the you know numerous sports websites and with various writers so and quickly that's too right. now like it's so easy to upload a video like tmz credit the credit tmz they got their hands on the video apparently before the nfl did that's right and according to the nfl they did try three or four times um to get this video uh for those of you who aren't football fans ray rice was accused well i guess he wasn't accused he was uh at a nightclub in february he uh punched his girlfriend and knocked her out. Uh, a video was then released uh, four or five months later of him dragging her unconscious body out of the elevator. Yep. Um, Ray Rice had told Roger Goodell, the commissioner of football, that he had struck his wife, fiance at the time. Um, and then Goodell in turn suspended him two games. The video was then released and then he turned around and suspended him indefinitely for something that he's already been punished for. So Ray Rice is appealing this. Um, and it's kind of, like you said, it's opened up some scrutiny just like based on what they're allowed to do in the collective bargaining agreement. Like these players sign contracts so that if they do break the rules, there are already punishments in place. However, the media doesn't believe these punishments were harsh enough. So the NFL or other leagues have kind of overstepped their boundaries and said, well, too bad. Well, I definitely think there's more more to the story of the Ray Race incident. Um, I think Goodell, Roger Goodell, the the NFL commissioner, is is yeah. tried to backtrack and cover his I believe his bases um, because there, the opinion and the, and the belief amongst other people within the organ you know within the organization of what the NFL is um, and other prominent you know um, insiders yeah. from sports NFL whatnot just it, just the opinion feels that the, there's more to what what really What's happened being, behind yeah. the behind the closed doors um, but essentially uh, Unfortunately, uh, Ray Rice will play again. He, he will, will be back in the NFL, and so will Adrian Peterson. Um, the Peter, see, Peterson situation was a little different. Again, yeah. the NFL kind of overstepped their boundaries a little bit. They kind of flip-flop on their position. Um, Peterson uh, was accused, or I guess he pled guilty now, so to hitting his son with a wooden switch. Um, it was strictly for punishment, so it, you can't really categorize that into domestic abuse and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but initially, Goodell again flip-flopped on that situation, and he was suspended, and then he was, and then he wasn't, and now he's suspended indefinitely. Um, going in agreements now, since they've switched the CBA up again on August 26th or something, where they have the right to suspend players for that long. Mm -hmm. um, however, Adrian Peterson's case happened in May, so should they be able to retroactively go back and place him on that kind of a suspension. When when he broke the rules, those rules weren't in place. So yeah. it's kind of an interesting... Well, the other, uh, the other thing coming into play with the Adrian Peterson story is that corporate sponsors who support and sponsor the Minnesota Vikings have pulled, pulled their money out from the organization, which you know, it's a money-making business. I mean, Definitely. hand over fist, and that's what, they're, that's what they're interested in. They're interested in making money. So when you have corporate sponsors pulling money and sponsorship out of teams that looks bad for the league and looks bad for the situation Definitely. so they have had to react on that and kind of support the minnesota vikings organization in 
um, you know, not wanting not, him back. Not, not, not wanting him back. Now he's going back to court um, on December second for well, his appeal. For his appeal, yes. that's right. Yeah. And um, from there, we'll we'll see we'll see uh, how the league goes. I believe both players won't be back this season. In my personal opinion, I don't think. Any team will uh, risk the media scrutiny of signing either of these players this season. I, I, However, I, I, I believe during the off season, once every there's been some more stories and everybody else's minds kind of off of those, I believe they'll get a fresh chance. Oh, uh, absolutely. I, I have to agree. I mean, I don't think that I think it's too late in the ball game now for either one of them to come back. I mean, we're going into week uh, week 13. four, we're week fourteen of the yep. NFL, and I mean, teams are lining up their their playoff, playoff. rosters, getting ready for playoffs, ready to make that last last uh, you know. To the to the finish line, and um, what I can what I see um, is both Ray Rice and Adrian Peterson being back next year. Yeah. Um, Do you think it'll it, be with either of the former teams? Do you think uh, absolutely Ray not? Rice will no. Be with what I or? what I see is um, I see Adrian Peterson. I see a couple of op options. One. He could go and get a fresh start somewhere that w like a St. Louis. Yeah. St. Louis Rams. One, they might be relocating to LA. That would be a good open market to yeah. for for you know Adrian Peterson to start over new. The second thing was Jeff Fisher, the head coach of the St. Louis Rams. He he drafted Michael Sam, who was the first yeah. openly gay NFL football so he, player. He was a very good college player. Didn't make the team. Got cut from the practice squad. Went to the Dallas Cowboys. Got cut from that practice squad. So he he might not have had the talent to make the NFL no, exactly. you know, roster, but someone like a Jeff Fisher could put in the structure and, and, and the support, and he also has the experience that would have some, some well, cachet in the NFL. And it's also possible in the NFL to make a comeback. I mean, look at Michael Vick. Oh, absolutely. Uh, like, he, heinous, he, he heinous, heinous acts. Yeah. Heinous, and he served his time in jail, and yep. he's come back. He's a reformed person, so yep. they say. Like yep. uh, He seems like he's doing well for the community, doing well for himself, and he's playing very good football. He's the leading NFL rusher for quarterbacks now of all time, yep. 6,000 plus rushing yards. So yep. um, it is certainly possible for players to come back after they've had, I mean, we've all made bad decisions. So yep. it's just if when you they make bad decisions, it's in front of millions and millions right. of people. So uh, I, another interesting uh, thought that I had that uh, I know, I know, uh, either Ray Rice or Adrian Peterson go to is, is the New England Patriots. And because Bel Belichick is the master as, as far as um, getting the most out of his players and getting his players to buy in. Case in point, what happened yesterday. So last week, the New England Patriots go out and they, they win convincingly. With Jonas Gray or Jonas Aaron Gray? Gray Jonas, Jonas Gray. Gray. Four now, touchdowns. Four touchdowns, over 200 yards rushing. He single-handedly swayed many, many fantasy football matches that week. So what happens this upcoming week? He's late for practice. He's late for practice. He doesn't even play on Sunday. Not Who plays? Who's the starting Le running Le back? Blunt. Uh, Le they Garrett Blunt, who coincidentally was cut from the Pittsburgh Steelers earlier this same week um, when he left the field earlier, early from the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers victory over yeah. the Tennessee Titans. And he come out with two touchdowns. That's right. And so, I mean, if if anybody can, can start over new with, with a good guidance system, it, it can definitely be uh, with the New England Patriots and Bill Belichick. Could you imagine Adrian Peterson with Tom Brady? Uh, I, I, <laughs> that, that, that would be I'm just, just about I'm glad, I'm glad Tom I root Brady, for Adrian Peterson and Rod, Rod, Rod Gronkowski. Yeah. That would be almost unstoppable. Well, like, that would be one well. of the best tight ends in the league of all. Like right now, Gronkowski could end up going down if he continues his play as one of the best tight ends of all time, really. And then you throw in Adrian Peterson, who has potential to be one of the best running backs of all time, and Tom Brady, who has potential to be one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Well, Tom Brady is one of the best quarterbacks, bar none, uh, in, in uh, NFL yeah, top history. Five, definitely. And, as for, you and touched he's not on, even retired. That's so. right. And you touched on Rob Gronkowski, and um, in, in my opinion, there's no single football no. player that, that moves the needle pound. like him. Like yeah, he's... I mean, he, he uh, him playing healthy – Transforms their team. Completely. Oh, definitely. And I mean, they're a serious, serious threat to win the. Definitely, win the they, they made a lot of analysts look silly at the yeah, start of this absolutely. year when they started off a little slow, well, and then a healthy Gronk come back and. Well, that's 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 the uh, that's the that's that's the nature of the business now. It's so, uh, as we said earlier, everything's so uh, you know. It, it can change quickly out there as far as you know opinions and stuff yeah. like that. And I mean, all it takes is a few people to to say one thing, and it gains a little bit of yeah. momentum and. Look at look and, how it goes. Uh, <laughs>
Also, uh, some winners we had in this week. Um, the Pats beat the Detroit uh, mm -hmm. Lions. Uh, Detroit's really struggling now. Matt Stafford hasn't scored a touchdown in two straight games. Um, so that's kind of an option or kind of uh, surprising, well, I guess. Well, surprising this year. I, I, Calvin Johnson's probably still not fully healed from that from the injury that no, he, exactly. he was out for three or four weeks. And I mean, you but, take Calvin Johnson out of a out of a passing attack, not even out, not at full strength. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's going to be compromised. I believe they're averaging under 24 points per game, though. And with Matthew Stafford as quarterback, he should be able to average more than 24 points per game. Uh, their defense is playing very well. So, yeah. I mean, that's kind of surprising, though, just because Detroit was expected to be a really good team this year. Um, Denver Broncos squeaked out a win against uh, Miami Dolphins last night. Mm -hmm. uh, Peyton Manning was lights out, of course. But uh, the defense, I'm not really 100% sure. Well, I mean, Chad Henney looked good, but... Uh, not really 100% sure what happened with well, the defense. Well, Miami, so. Miami's a tough team, and I mean, any any NFL team going east to west, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the the numbers don't don't lie. I mean, they have a tough time with the time adjustment and things like that. The 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 records, you know, significantly favor the the, the home west coast teams. So do you so, still consider Denver a favorite though? They have struggled uh, the last two weeks. They lost to St. Louis the week before and just barely beat out Miami. So are they still considered? Well, for me, it really comes down to home field advantage and. And right now, New England with a better record at 9-2 do have that home field advantage. So, New England's in Green Bay next week. They, uh, they, that's I gonna mean, that's going to be a game. tough game. So, the, even with that, that could that would drop them to 9-3. But New England holds a tie break because they beat Denver yeah, earlier this guess. year. So, New England's going to have to kind of um, screw up a couple times to, uh, to, to, to lose that home yeah. field. Uh, so, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I don't see Denver really – doing much yeah. against uh so who's you know. your favorite in the nfc um well um i think with arizona's losing their starting quarterback carson palmer to a that year end injury, um they do have the best record the number one seed at this time however with drew stanton you know uh completely different quarterback I mean, um, larry he, fitzgerald's out too i believe he, as he well, didn't play so. yeah he didn't play yesterday drew stanton's a fine backup quarterback he can get you maybe a win or two but it's going to be hard to carry your team in the playoffs. That's when. right. And you're playing. They're playing in a very tough division with Seattle, San Francisco. Um, San you know. Francisco's looked relatively ordinary this year as well. Um, well, just, earlier in the year they had some, some, some. I think some background noise as yeah, far as uh, play, players not happy with Jim Harbaugh. They had a couple significant suspensions with uh, defensive. Uh, you know. Yeah, stars. Uh, Kaepernick really hasn't really taken that step forward. For me, I, I still I, I like Green Bay. I mean, you give me Aaron Rodgers any day oh, of the man. week. He is um, amazing. He's he's phenomenal. Philadelphia so. Eagles have looked very well. Um, they seem to dominate the teams that they should, but then they seem to kind of look pedestrian against the real contenders. So what's what do you think of the Eagles? Are they well, I mean, or? I'm a big fan of the Eagles, uh, and uh, with Nick Foles in there, they were. Uh, a more of a uh, a team that you could take seriously. However, with Mark Sanchez, I mean, he is two and one uh, backing up since since Foles was hurt and lost for the year. Um, but I don't see him going on the road and uh, winning. You know, Numerous a game in Green games, Bay, yeah. a game in Arizona or Seattle, whoever comes out of the West with the number one seed, because um, Philly does have a tough schedule. So they very well might not even make playoffs. They play. They play, they play Dallas two more times, and um, they have Seattle at home, so those are not easy easy games. No, definitely not. Um, Johnny Football in Cleveland. Are, is Cleveland Browns for real? Like, uh, Brian uh, Hoyer is uh, leading them very well. Josh Gordon come back from his marijuana suspension, mm -hmm. uh, 10 games, and he tore it up, eight receptions, over 100 yards. Uh, he did it, showed no signs of rest there as well. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but do you think they're for real? Like, I believe they've got a winning record right now, nine and six. Uh, Johnny Football was also mentioned in a brawl Saturday night, so there's a little more controversy there for him. But well, I mean, I think Cleveland's definitely um, um, proven some doubters wrong this year, and Brian Hoyer, the starting quarterback, has has played admirably. I mean, he's not a superstar, but he's okay. Um, I, will they be a factor this year? Probably not. I mean, they got some tough teams like we just talked about, Denver, New England, in their own division. I mean, yeah. they got Cincinnati, Baltimore, Pittsburgh. I mean, they most likely won't even make playoffs. 
as a as a, as a fan, uh, I, I would be very happy if I was a fan of the Cleveland Browns oh, way that they, they've, they've done what they've done well. this year. And I mean, they last last off season, I mean, they couldn't they couldn't give their head coaching job away. No. I mean, it was like the tenth tenth choice. So um, what they've done this year they, is is very very good, and they should be proud of what they've what they've done. All right, guys, so uh, we're just going to get ready for a commercial break. Uh, if you want to give us a call back um, when we come back, again, the number is 1-855-529-8826. Uh, again, it's John Smith and Jason Speedy, and uh, we'll be more than happy to take your questions or take some opinions, so uh, feel free to give us a call. At Fredericton Nissan, they're proud to say most of their staff have been here for over 20 years. So you know you're dealing with an experienced and trusted team of professionals in both sales and service. Fixing it right the first time. That's what it takes to be a Nissan technician. Drop by Fredericton Nissan at 580 Prospect Street and discover why Nissan is the fastest growing brand in Canada. Today, we bring you the first part of our global broadcast exclusive conversation. The streets of Tahrir have once again been filled. Key issues here at the United Nations Climate Change Conference remain unresolved. Police are saying the protesters to move further and further away. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now! This is New Brunswick's independent community channel, CHCO-TV. We live in Charlotte County. Good evening, folks. Um, welcome back. I'm Jonathan Smith, and this is... I'm Jason Speedy. Um, I just, we're coming back from break, and I checked my Facebook, so I figure I, we kind of just briefly touched on hockey, so I do got to give out a couple more shout outs in hockey. Um, for all you Montreal fans, be happy. Your Montreal Canadiens are in first place. Um, they are playing well despite losing uh, to the New York Rangers the other night, 5 nothing. Kind of had to throw that out there too, but uh, they nice. are playing very well. Always good. <laughs> um, they do play again tonight as well against the Bruins, so that should be an interesting game. Um, again, Calgary has uh, kind of been an upstart shock in the league as well. They've uh, in fourth place in the West. The um, five come from behind wins in the third period. Yep. Um, best in the NHL. They've outscored their opposition 30 to 14 in the third. So, again, very impressive for a couple of Canadian teams. Unlike the two that we did touch on that were relatively <laughs> disappointing, we do have some good Canadian teams that are playing. So, no, Vancouver's not doing too bad. Either. No, Vancouver actually yeah. they've playing very well. Yeah. Um, coming back from John Tortorella, a lot of people kind of gave them. Uh, threw them under the bus, didn't think they'd be able to win with the core of the Sedins and BX and yeah. Ryan Miller. So yes, they are playing very well as well. Yeah. Um, and mind you, the Leafs are in playoff contention at the moment. They yeah, just right now, if, if the playoffs, I mean, granted, that's a long ways away, yeah. but if the playoffs started today, it'd be they are in, Montreal. They are it'd be a playoffs, pretty, so. pretty significant matchup. Yeah, <laughs> so it'd definitely be interesting for all you Montreal fans that like to give me a hard time. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Another going into basketball now. Um, we're going to touch on the Raptors. They've started out the season amazingly well. They're yeah, eleven and awesome. two. Yeah. Um, I believe. I'm not sure if they're still first place in the or overall in the NBA or if they're second now. I believe Memphis may have went ahead. Um, however, we are first place in the East with an eleven and two record. Uh, since we've traded Rudy Gay last year after a six and twelve start, we've gone fifty two and twenty four. Uh, it's the best record in the East. Four and a half games better than Chicago. Uh, so that's pretty significant. Um, yeah. Well, when you gotta say that, you gotta say that with the fact that Derrick Rose hasn't been healthy. No, I mean, Derrick Rose is a, a exactly, he changes exactly. games. I mean, there's no question about that. And he changes teams with with him uh, uh, healthy in the lineup. Chicago is a real real player but for the NBA championship. Is Derrick Rose ever going to be healthy again? Like to, to me right now, Chicago, I do consider them um, legitimate contenders against like in the league. However. Pau Gasol and Derrick Rose and Joaquin Noah are all very injury-prone players. Like, they are very good, but what are the odds that you're going to get all three of them healthy at the same time for a significant play? Well, you, you know, the, the one thing uh, about the NBA and the NHL seasons, well, Major League Baseball, too, with so, so many long. games, it, it, it is really, you know, it's, it's a marathon. So um, it's more important for the Chicago Bulls to, to have Derrick Rose sit out now if he's feeling, you know, not 100% no, exactly. rather than in that. April or May, right? Because that's when they're really going to need him. 
Uh, I am very optimistic and hope, hopeful that Derrick Rose will be able to continue with a, you know, a, a healthy career because he is just a real treat to watch. Oh, he is phenomenal, yeah. but it's been three years really three since years, we've yeah. seen him at all-star caliber and he is kind of an injury prone player. He is, yeah, um, and, and I mean that's again, again. same as Pau Gasol, he has hardly played so many games over the last four or five seasons as well. Yeah. Um, but again, like injuries can ruin a season. Look at OKC. They were going, coming into the season as top one, two favorites in the NBA. Absolutely. They lost Russell Westbrook, their starting point guard, and Kevin Durant, easily the second best player in the NBA behind LeBron James. Mm -hmm. And they are stuttering. Like it's yeah. a very good chance that they may miss the playoffs. Well, the, 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 the hope is with, with either one of them is that they both come back ready you know ready healthy you know i think westbrook's gonna be back within the next week or so um durant's gonna be a little bit longer oh, obviously okay. but i mean if he can get back and if they can just stay and hang around that 10th 11th 12th seed um in the west they could and and then they start it, winning some games um they it, could inch closer to you know a decent you know six seven seed they um, very well could it is just going to be very hard in the west i believe last year to make the playoffs in the west you needed to win 55 games or 54 yeah. games oh yeah the west over the last so, five or six years has notoriously been a, a if, tougher a tougher conference no question if you need to win 54 games that means you can lose 28 they've already lost 13 or 14. yeah it's it's going to be a very serious uphill battle for them yeah. um but i mean if you're getting back the second best player in the league and then arguably a top 10 point guard in the league as well, then certainly should, could help. But. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, Duran, Westbrook, you pair them with uh, Serge Ibaka, maybe they can make a trade at the trade deadline, bring in another defender. Um, I know when they lost uh, Tabo Cephalosha last year, um, or this year in, in free agency, you know, that, that that was their number one defender, ball stopper. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, they, like I said, if they if they can hang around and, and kind of stay in that 11th, 12th, uh, but they do, I mean, they, they, they got to start winning some games, you know, they need some some of those uh, young players that they traded, uh, you know, step up a little bit. For, for, you know, they're, when they traded the James Harden. Uh, point guard, uh, what? Reggie Jackson. He is playing phenomenal. He's a good. He's a he good player. He, um, it's, it's a contract year for him though, yeah. so as well. So yeah. we'll see if uh, they can keep him, or it's going to end up being another Harden like thing where it's you can't have three big guys. That's right. That's right. So, well, and and I mean, uh, being being Lakers fans as we are, um, you know, our team has been bitten by the injury and, bug a little bit as well. With you know Steve, Steve Nash, you know he's done for the year. Most Probably likely done, done for, for his, his career, career. which is um, um, very too bad, really. He is one of the greatest Canadian basketball players of all time. Um, we do have a caller. It's uh, Ryan from Charlottetown. What um, What would you like to know, Ryan, or what would you like to ask? Or state? Um, yes, I'd just like to know, uh, what are your thoughts on Boston, uh, the Boston Red Sox um, putting out close to $200 million for two hitters? Uh, when realistically uh, the money should have been spent on pitching because they're one, two, three of Clay Buchholz, Joe Kelly, and Brandon Workman really aren't going to fare up that well in the American League East. Do you feel this was a good signing or were these bad signings? I am going to let Jason feel this one. I'm uh, more of a Jays fan than the Red Sox fan, so he knows all about her. What what I what I found with today's signings of Hanley Ramirez and Pablo Sandoval, I mean, they they're very good uh, hitters, very good players. There's no question about that. What I'm seeing though is what the is a little bit of what the Red Sox did back in 2011, bringing in Carl Crawford and Adrian Gonzalez, signing to big long-term contracts for big dollars didn't work out at all. Um, their 2011 season just torpedoed and they were eventually traded off to the LA Dodgers. So uh, what they got for success in 2013, they, 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 they concentrated on players that were not necessarily big names, but good chemistry, good clubhouse guys, guys that hustled, guys that played hard. Hanley Ramirez does not have that reputation. He's been a malcontent. He's been you know suspended from teams uh injury i remember a few years well. ago, injury prone a few years ago he played with the miami marlins he was benched because he didn't hustle out um going after a a, a ball so uh, do you think they should have maybe spent some of the money on the pitching like this, well getting like getting to or? his point he is absolutely correct i mean this is a lot of money for two very 
good hitters, but what their main need was this year was uh, it was to bolster their starting pitching. You mentioned Brandon Workman as being um, a starting pitcher. I think what would be best for the club and for him is to shift back to the bullpen because he was lights out in the 2000 World Series and uh, the, the, the playoff run overall. What I would like to see them do is commit you know, whatever it takes to get John Lester back. Um, I think he is a bona fide number one starter. He knows the, the, the city. The city loves him. And, you know, you, you, just, you just know what you're going to get with John Lester. What I would also like to see them do is maybe um, look at maybe a couple cheaper options. Another uh, person that's out there is Justin Masterson. He was with, got traded to the Cleveland Indians from the Boston Red Sox. And uh, he then, this past year was traded to St. Louis Cardinals, um, but he wasn't on their post postseason roster. So um, I'd like to see them maybe focus on getting, you know, someone like him, maybe um, with with this with the signings, if they are in fact going to move Hanley Ramirez to left field, maybe explore options in trading Yoannis uh, um, Cespedes. Um, I've heard of a rumor of him going to Seattle for Hishashi Iwakuma. Um, so if you pair those three, along with a Clay Buckholtz and a Joe Kelly, I think you got a very good. I think you got a very good uh, starting pitching. But I, I, I do agree with you that uh, they do need to. They need definitely need to turn their attention to to the starting pitching right now. Where would have you have liked to have seen the money spent, Ryan? Do you do you agree with the like the signings? Do you think they're good, or would you have rather seen it gone to some starting pitchers? I uh, myself, I would have liked to have seen it gone towards starting pitching uh, and address the problem there. Um, yes, bringing back John Lester would be great and potentially even targeting uh, Max Scherzer. Mm -hmm. I think would have benefited the uh, the franchise much better than uh, the off-injured Hanley Ramirez and Pablo Sandoval. Don't get me wrong, he's a great player, but he puts up rather average numbers throughout the actual season. Like he, uh, He's making his name for himself three of the last five years mm -hmm. in the playoffs, and that's where you win these big money contracts and you really set your name in history. But you need to get there first, and uh, I'm just not positive the, uh, the pitching is going to get them there. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, bringing back uh, Koji Uhara this year was 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 a good move. What I'd like to see them, uh, you know, I think their bullpen was a little bit underrated there last year. That you have young guys like Alex Wilson, Tommy Lane. Um, I'd like to maybe see them bring back Burke Badenhop. He had a rough rough go at the beginning of the season, but he was he was very solid down the stretch. Edward Mojica, he's also signed for for this year. He was a a very good uh, closer for St. Louis back in 2013 until he got hurt and you know lost his job to Trevor Rosenthal. But uh, I think the bullpen is 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 fine now. I think the lineup is is going to be solid. Um, but they they do uh, they do need to to f turn their attention to starting pitching. There's no question about that. I, I definitely think they're better with these signings than they were without the signings. But I do I do tend to agree with you that they do need to. Uh spend some more money on some pitching. Yeah, what I think, what will happen with Pavel Sandoval, Mike Napoli's uh, under contract for this year and then he's going to be a free agent. I think you'll see Sandoval shift over to first base and um, um, because the way, they call him Kung Fu Panda and it's, it's for a reason, right? He's a little bit on the heavier side. So, um, but he has he has proven to be a very good defensive third baseman and, um, you know, I, I would have liked to seen him maybe stay in San Francisco. There's not too many guys that stick with their home homegrown teams well, anymore. No, and, and, I mean, he was so successful over he, there. Three he was World there Series. for all three, I was going to say. Yeah, three all three World five, Series. So. He was uh, MVP of the 2012 um, World Series victory. And, um, you know, I mean, I mean, he's... To bring a winning, uh, to bring a winner into the dressing room, certainly can do a lot for a team as well. Like if he's won three out of the last five World Series, you kind of bring that attitude That's to right. the dressing room. Yeah. Like if you get behind, it's like, doesn't matter. Like I know we can win this game. That's right. Whereas if like, again, the Leafs or the Oilers, where you kind of get accustomed to that losing culture, if you let in a bad goal or two or a bad run or something, you kind of get on yourself. It's like, oh no, what, do I, what am I going to do now? What am, like, how am I going to recover from this? Yeah. So if you bring in winners, then they know that they can recover. Like, yeah, I mean, absolutely. He's going to pair very well with uh, Dustin Pedroia and David Ortiz. And, you know, um, David Ortiz, hopefully, and, uh, you know, will take Hanley Ramirez under his wing a little bit and kind of teach him the ropes on on how they do business in Boston, if you will, and uh, what will be accepted and won't, won't, what won't be. And, um, you know, Dustin Pedroia, again, I mean, is someone like him, his, and he's not going to put up with, you know, someone taking... Uh, and I suppose Boston has no up. problems with 
having winners in the dressing room as they've won numerous in the last 10 years they, as well. They've so. had some good luck over the last 10 years, but the first, uh, the 86 that preceded that, not so much. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, the Jays uh, also signed Russell Martin. Um, so that should be a good signing, I believe. Uh, um, so, so Ryan, what, what, what do you, where do you see them going, going now with, with, with respect to the division? Do you think they're now with these signings a top contender for the AL East? Or do you think, you know, the Baltimores and the, and the New York Yankees still have a leg up on them? And Toronto Blue Jays uh, I, for that matter. I definitely think that the Baltimores, the Yankees have the, uh, the ups on them. I mean, they're going to be fun to watch. They're, they're going to put up five, six, seven runs a game, but at the same time, uh, the defense is going to be on the field just as long That's right. uh, as the, uh, well, I, I guess it just depends as how early as you can get to that bullpen that they have, which, uh, which you said, Jason, was very underrated last year. Um, if, you, if you go to a Red Sox game, prepared to, uh, be prepared to sit there for a while. It's going to be a shootout, but at the same yeah. time, it's going to be entertaining. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I guess the last question I, just, I have about this is, uh, from a personal level, would you, like based on these trades, would you pick up or trade for Pablo Sandoval or Hanley Ramirez on your fantasy baseball team? I, well, I mean, pa Pablo Sandoval, um, and you had mentioned earlier, he's, he's been lights out in the playoffs the last, in 2012 and, and earlier this year. The problem with Sandoval is he, his counting stats aren't really that, that significant. Having said that, there isn't a lot of other third basemen out there that, that really, you know, uh, push the needle as far as fantasy stats go. I mean, you have um, Kyle Seager in Seattle, um, Pedro Alvarez in Pittsburgh. Um, Sandoval, you know, I mean, he, he'll, he'll be healthy and he'll, he'll, you know, hopefully bang some off the green monster there. As far as Hanley Ramirez, I mean... If he stays healthy, he, he'll be a stud. I mean, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, it depends on his position eligibility. I mean, if, if, if they are, in fact, moving him to the outfield, I mean, he'd be a mid, you know, a mid, um, you know, top 15, top 20 outfielder, I would think, um, you know, based on his, you know, health history and, and, and stats, uh, you know, moving over to the American League and whatnot. Um, if he were to stay at shortstop, what does that do for Xander Bogarts? Um, you know, that's that's kind of a, a, a big question because I mean, they the Red Sox have put a lot of stock into into Bogarts and his his progress and yeah. and marketing him as almost like the next the next big Boston yeah. icon and and with all, all you know all credit to him. Um, he performed very well in the World Series. He had a little bit of a of a bad year last year, but you know, I mean, he's 22 years old. It's, it's, that's going to yeah, happen, definitely. right? So um, to answer your question, I would uh, I would always support choosing some Red Sox on your fantasy teams. <laughs> I, I myself probably wouldn't pick Hanley Ramirez, just like if you picked at the start of the season, just due to the injury history. Um, I do think Sandoval will do all right in the American yep. League East. So. Yep. yep. I mean, he's going to be facing weak, weaker pitching as well. I find the pitching's not as strong in the AL as it is in the NL. Um, he'll be facing R.A. Dickey in some of the more pitcher-friendly park or hitter-friendly parks as yep. well. So. Yep. Well, that's right. I mean, everybody's stats goes up at... Yankee Stadium, Blue Jay, like Roger, Roger, Roger Center, Center. Um, you know those are those are hitting havens, yeah. right? So, so, yeah, I think uh, I think they'd be worthy worthy pickups. I, I'd pick Sandoval. I'd question Ramirez myself. <laughs> so that's me. <laughs> I would be all in. <laughs> I think he'll do fine. Um. So uh, the Blue Jays. What do you think about the Blue Jays? Uh, they've picked up Russell Martin. Uh, we've kind of got on to that. He's. Uh, Canadian, so I mean that's pretty cool that he gets to play for his hometown Toronto Blue Jays. Um, yep. Um, what I see with the with the Blue Jays is what they what they normally do. They 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 put out the the you know the stories that they're in on these guys. I mean they've been linked to Pablo Sandoval this year, John Lester this Tory year, Hunter. <laughs> Tory Hunter. Um, we'll see which one of them actually goes to the Blue Jays. But I mean they should still have a solid enough roster coming back to them this year as well um, with Edwin Encarnacion, Joey Bats, or like Jose Batista, I guess. Yeah. Um, so they should have an all right roster. Uh, the Russell Martin signing definitely wouldn't hurt, but I would like to see them bolster up their starting pitching. Um, again, kind of the same deal with your Red Sox, just maybe another pitcher or two. Well, what the, what the Blue Jays need to do is they, they need to 
they need to build their starting pitching in their bullpen. Yeah. Um, it's been a letdown point for them the last few years. They were rumored for Andrew Miller, who was a, a lefty specialist for the Boston Red Sox, got traded to the Orioles last year, was lights out once he got traded to the Orioles. He is a real, he is a real bona fide closer in the making. And if they were smart, they would throw whatever they needed to to, to sign him to a three to four year. That contract. AL East is one like one of the toughest divisions in baseball. Just oh, absolutely, it, it seems to always have one of the best teams in the league, whether it be the Yankees, whether it be the Red Sox, the Rays, or even last year the Orioles. That's right. So I mean, well, it's very tough. The uh, the Rays this year are gonna are gonna be. I mean, they're gonna be hurt without having manager Joe Madden there. Definitely. I mean, for for all the publicity and the and the accolades that he gets, he does deserve them because he's turned a very fledgling franchise with very minimal fan support uh, into uh, you know I mean into con into a contender. Uh, and even they had the like when they were contenders like every year they for those four or five years in a row they had the lowest like one of the league's lowest payrolls That's as well. Right. So yeah, it's um, people like and then you look at the Yankees who can throw out the hundreds of millions and go into the salary cap and yeah. Well, and and you know I mean and you tax. and you and as a Red Sox fan you always hear those arguments, but you know. Uh, you, you can look to even this year's uh, the World Series. Throw out the money too. So. Well, that's right. Well, you can look at this year's World Series champs. Um, San Francisco won with the likes of Joe Panic. Yeah. Who would have heard of him? Um, you know, um, I mean, Baumgartner was was a stud and lights out. But I mean, Joe Panic, Michael Morse, um, Gregor Blanco. These guys weren't even supposed no. to be integral parts of the team. Matt Cain was hurt all year. He didn't pitch in the playoffs. He makes $18 million a year. Um, you have players like Marco Scudero, didn't play at all, hardly at all this year. He, he was lost for the year. Tim Linscombe, who is, you know, multiple Cy Young Award winner, pitching no-hitter in back-to-back -back seasons, he didn't even he get a sniff a in, the, in the World Series. So, year, so, I mean, you have a lot of money that's committed to those types of players. Angel Pagan, another one. A lot of money committed to those guys that they, they didn't even contribute in the in the World Series victory itself. No, so, exactly. so people hiding behind the 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 fact that these you bigger can teams. Spend money. It it's, it's about it's, it's about, about the, the scouting and it's, and it's about yeah, who, who you sign as free agents and and what kind of de development you have going from single A all the way up. Yeah. And then even, the, even the culture that you have around your team. That's like correct. if you have a winning culture, then you're more apt to win. If you have a losing culture, like. Again, I hate to keep bringing up the Leafs, but it's a losing culture. They have won since 67, but you look at the Detroit Red Wings, who not like year draft. Year in, year out. Year in, year out. And yeah. it's, they build, they do it through drafting. Like you said, it's all in your scouting. It's all in your yeah. drafting. It's how you bring up your young players. If you're going to give them the chance to grow or if you're just going to usher them, rush them in the league, which could be like an Edmonton Oilers issue is they rush them into the league and didn't give them a chance to, to progress. To progress yeah. and become dominant in another league where they feel so much more confident going into the next league. You touched upon the, the culture of the ball club, and, and I find that that is a big issue with, with the Blue Jays as well. Um, when, you, when you have these winning teams, um, there's, about, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a good, strong culture of winning, um, selflessness, things like that. I don't find that Jose Batista, Edwin Encarnacion, I don't I don't feel that they, their body language exhibit that. No, they, they, they're, they're more they, about themselves. They seem more about themselves. Then, well, you look at the Raptors now, like you talk about being selfless or whatever. The Raptors are 11-2. and two. They're playing fearless basketball, like Pat, like co complete team basketball. Same way the San Antonio Spurs won last year. Like they, yep. If you play as a team, you'll win as a team. If you play as an individual, you're going to lose as an individual. Well, and, and, as lose and, as a team. and um, you know, you brought up the Raptors. I think you know they they have a real solid chance this, there this year. And I mean, they're under the salary cap. They could pick up, a you know, other guys you know, at the and, trade deadline or or whatever. Um, they do have that that opportunity to maneuver around that. So um, I'd say look out for them. Yeah, I mean, they've definitely they've built up enough of a lead now at 11 and two in the East. If they continue to just play even above average basketball, they could certainly secure down that number one seed. Yeah. Um, the Cleveland Cavaliers are beneath 500 now, so it's going to take them a little bit of basketball to, I mean, they're already five, four or five games behind the Raptors. So yeah. if the Raptors can even play four or five games better than the Cavaliers all season, they've got the one number one seed. Well, they play, they trounced them at home, uh, on Cleveland's floor there the other night. And Losing then, by 18 in the first quarter and come back and beat them by 17. Yeah, so, I mean, no, that's a, a It was a, phenom a phenomenal effort, and it just goes to show that just because you might have the, the, the big name, yeah. LeBron James, 
Kyrie Irving, Kevin Love on your on your team. It's more than just talent. If you play it, as a it, team, it's, 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 it's playing as a team, and that's definitely what Toronto has. You know, they have the Kyle Lowry's, the Demar Derozan's. They want to play for each other. That's it's right. Like it's a band of brothers. Like that's if right. you want, if you if you're playing as a team, like if you don't mind stepping it, like if you have complete trust in your team as well. Like if you know, like if I we're playing a sport and I know you you're gonna mark your guy, then I don't have to worry about it. But if you have doubt in your teammates or you don't have faith in your teammates. You're gonna try and pinch over, like I try and pinch over and cover your guy. Yeah. And then that leaves my guy unmarked, and it's just you've got to have complete team confidence, and you have to believe in each other, and continuously work towards it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And and I mean they do, and they have got you know savvy veterans, Tyler Hansbro, Lamir Johnson, Lou Williams, Lou Eastern Williams, conference player off of the, the bench. Yeah. So, that's uh, right. Averaging 24 points coming off the bench, he scored 36 in that Cleveland Cavaliers win, um, buzzer beater. Uh, so he's just been phenomenal. Yeah. It's um, looking good. Yeah, yeah it's, so. it's a good, fun team to root for. Yeah, so uh, that's it for us this week, I guess, guys. There's uh, an awesome game to look out for this week in the basketball. If you want to watch the basketball, the Raptors are playing the Dallas Mavericks, the one and two offenses in the league on Friday night. Um, so definitely tune into that, and it's been a pleasure. We'll be back again next week. Again, I'm John Smith, and uh, I'm Jason Speedy. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.